So listen, my brethren, my peoples, the words of Tecumseh. So live your life so that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion. Respect others in their view and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and its purpose in the service of your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day when you go over the great divide. Always give a word or a sign of salute when meeting or passing a friend, even a stranger when in a lonely place. Show respect to all people and grovel to none. You always give a word or sign of salute when meeting or passing a friend, even a stranger when in a lonely place. You give a word or a sign of salute to them and show respect to all people and grovel to none. When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies only in yourself. Abuse no one and no thing, for abuse turns the wise ones to fools and robs the spirit of its vision. When it comes your time to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with the fear of death, so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. Thomas J. Tecumseh, Shawnee Warrior. Following speech by the great Shawnee Warrior and Statesman Chief Tecumseh, as included in the following magazine article by Simon Pokagon, Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Nation, published 1899. Tecumseh's speech spoken, 1800, Harper's New Monthly Magazine, March 1899, page 649 to 656. The Massacre of Fort Dearborn at Chicago by Sam Simon Pokagon, chief of the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi Nation. He, Tecumseh, generally spoke as follows. Before me stand the rightful owners of Kwa Nachi Wiaki. Kwa Nachi Wiaki, this beautiful land. The Great Spirit in His wisdom gave it to you and your children to defend and placed you here. But Atiwa, alas, the incoming race like a huge serpent is coiling closer and closer about you. Not content with hemming you in on every side they have built at Chicagong. Chicagong. Chicago. At the very center of our country, a military fort garrisoned with soldiers ready and equipped for battle. As sure as Waquanog, the heavens are above you, they are determined to destroy you and your children. Occupy this godly land themselves, then they will destroy these forests whose branches wave in the winds above the graves. Your fathers chant in their praises. If you doubt it, come. Go with me eastward or southward a few days journey along your ancient Mekonog trails and I will show you a land you once occupied made de desolate. There the, fo the forest of untold years have been hewn down and cast into the fire. There be Shekki, Wamashkashi, the buffalo and the deer, Pinai Shin, Kigon, the fowl and fish are all gone. There the woodland birds whose sweet songs once pleased your ears have forsaken the land, never to return. And Wabiganag, Wabiganag, the wildflowers, which your maidens once loved to wear, have all withered and died. You must bear in mind these strangers are not as you. They are devoid of natural affection, loving gold or gain better than one another, or Kichi Shag, Kichi Chag, or Kit Chit Chag, their own souls. Some of them follow on your track as quietly as maul and gone. The wolf pursues the deer to shoot you down as you hunt and kill Mishibiji, the panther. But a few years since I saw with my own eyes a young white man near the Ohio River. He was held by our people as a prisoner of war. He won the hearts of his captors with his apparent friendship and goodwill while murder was in his heart. They trusted him as they trusted one another, but he most treacherously betrayed their confidence and secretly killed not less 
the next to no, 20 before his crimes were detected and then he fled. In the early 1800s, two Shawnee brothers, Tecumseh and the Prophet, organized many Native American nations into a confederation. They wanted to keep white settlers from taking more Indian lands. One problem they faced was that some Indian leaders agreed to sell land to the United States. In the following speech, Tecumseh argued that no one had the right to sell land since it belonged to all the people. Sell a country? Why not sell the air? Houses are built for you to hold councils in. The Indians hold theirs in the open air. I'm Shawnee. My forefathers were warriors. Their son is a warrior. From them, I only take my existence. From my tribe, I take nothing. I have made myself what I am, and I would that I could make the red people as great as the conceptions of my own mind when I think of the great spirit that rules over us all. I would not then come to Governor Harrison to ask him to tear up the treaty. Tecumseh referred to the 1795 Treaty of Greenville, which gave the United States parts of the Northwest Territory. He had refused to attend the Greenville Peace Council. But I would say to him, Brother, you are the liberty, you have the liberty to return to your own country. You wish to prevent the Indians from doing as we wish them to unite and let them consider their lands as the common property of the whole. You take the tribes aside and advise them not to come in to this measure. You want by your distinctions of Indian tribes and allotting to each a particular to make them war with each other. You never see an Indian endeavor to make the white people do this. You are continually driving the red people when at last you will drive them into the Great Lake, Lake Michigan where they can neither stand nor work. Since my residence at Tippecanoe, we have endeavored to level distinctions to destroy village chiefs by whom all mischiefs were done. It is they who sell the land to the Americans. Brother, this land that was sold and the goods that were given for it was only done by a few. In the future, we are prepared to punish those who propose to sell land to the Americans. If you continue to purchase them, it will make war among the different tribes. And at last, I do not know what will be the consequences among the white people. The way, the only way to stop this evil is for the red man to unite in claiming a common and equal right to the land as it was at first and should be now, for it was never divided but belongs to us all. No tribe has the right to sell, even to each other, much less to strangers, sell a country. Why not sell the air, the great sea? as well as the earth. Did not the great spirit make them all for the use of his children? How can we have confidence in the white people? When Jesus Christ came upon the earth, you killed him and nailed him to the cross. You thought he was dead, and you were mistaken. You have the shakers among you, and you laugh and make light of their worship. Everything I have told you is the truth. The great spirit has inspired me. It's a speech to the... Osages winter 1811 to 12 One of the great figures of early Native American resistance to colonization was Tecumseh a Shawnee leader who earned a reputation for his skills in fighting white settlers and militias in the Midwest he and his brother worked toward the unification of Indians to struggle collectively against the encroachment on their lands by colonists as they expanded westward. Here he speaks to the Osages, the Osages, the Osages, about the struggle against the colonists, arguing that nothing will satisfy them but the whole of our hunting grounds, from the rising to the setting sun. Introduction from Zen and Arnov's Voices of a People's History of the United States. Brothers, we all belong to one family. We are all children of the Great Spirit. We walk in the same path. Slake our thirst at the same spring, and now affairs of the greatest concern lead us to smoke the pipe around the same council fire. Brothers, we are friends. We must assist each other to bear our burdens. The blood of many of our fathers and brothers has run like water on the ground to satisfy the avarice, the greed of the white men. We ourselves are threatened with a great evil. Nothing will pacify them but the destruction of all the red men. Brothers, when the white men first set foot on our grounds, 
They were hungry. They had no place on which to spread their blankets to kindle their fires. They were feeble. They could do nothing for themselves. Our Father commiserated their distress, shared freely with them. Whatever the Great Spirit had given His red children, they gave them food when hungry, medicine when sick, spread skins for them to sleep on, and gave them grounds that they might hunt and raise corn. Brothers, the white people are like poisonous serpents. When chilled, they are feeble and harmless, but invigorate them with warmth, and they sting their benefactors to death. The white people came among us feeble. Now we have made them strong. They wish to kill us or drive us back as they would wolves and panthers. Brothers, the white men are not friends to the Indians. At first, they only asked for land sufficient for a wigwam. Now nothing will satisfy them but the whole of our hunting grounds from the rising to the setting sun. The white men want more than our hunting grounds. They wish to kill our warriors. They wish to even kill our old men, women, and little ones. Many winters ago there was no land. The sun did not rise and set. All was darkness. The great spirit made all things. He gave the white people a home beyond the great waters. He supplied these grounds with game and gave them to his red children. And he gave them strength and courage to defend them brothers. My people wished for peace. The red men all wished for peace. But where the white people are, there is no peace for them except it be on the bosom of our mother. The white men despise and cheat the Indians. They abuse and insult them. They do not think the red men sufficiently good to live. The red men have borne many and great injuries. They ought to suffer them no longer. My people will not. They are determined on vengeance. They have taken up the tomahawk. They will make it fat with blood. They will drink the blood of white people. Brothers, my people are brave and numerous and the white people are too strong for them alone. I wish you to take up the tomahawk with them. If we all unite, we will all cause the rivers to stain the great waters with their blood. If you do not unite with us, they will first destroy us, and then you will fall an easy prey to them. They have destroyed many nations of red men because they were not united, because they were not friends to each other. Brothers, the white people send runners against us. They wish to make us enemies that they may sweep over and desolate our hunting grounds like devastating winds or rushing waters. Brothers, our great father over the great waters is angry with the white people, our enemies. He will send his brave warriors against them. He will send us rifles and whatever else we want. He is our friend and we are his children. Brothers, who are the white people that we should fear them? We cannot they cannot run fast, and are good marks to shoot at. They are only men. Our fathers have killed many of them. We are not squaws, and we will stain the earth red with blood. Brothers, the great spirit is angry with our enemies. He speaks in thunder, and the earth swallows up villages and drinks up the Mississippi. The great waters will cover their lowlands. Their corn cannot grow, and the great spirit will sweep those who escape to the hills from the earth with this terrible breach. Brothers, we must be united. We must smoke the same pipe. We must fight each other's battles. And more than all, we must love the great spirits. He is for us. He will destroy our enemies and make all of his red children happy. So live your life so that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion. Respect others in their view and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and his purpose in the service of your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day for when you go over the great divide. Always keep a word or a sign of salute when meeting or passing a friend, even a stranger when in a lonely place. Show respect to all people but bow to none when you arise in the morning give thanks for the food for the joy of living if you see no reason for giving thanks the fault lies only in yourself abuse no one and nothing for abuse turns the wise ones to fools and robs the spirit of its vision when it comes to your time to die be not like those whose hearts are filled with fear of death so that when their time comes they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero. 
going home. Just to throw in a Talgayita speech, Johnny Logan, Chief Logan, Talgayita. I appeal to any white man to say if he entered Logan's cabin hungry and he gave him not meat, if he ever he came cold and naked and he clothed him not, during the course of the last long and bloody war, Logan remained idle in his cabin and advocate for peace. Such was my love for the whites that my countrymen pointed as they passed and said, Logan is the friend of the white men. I have even thought to live with you but for the injuries of one man, Colonel Cresap. Cresap. C-R-E-S-A-P. The last spring in cold blood unprovoked murdered all the relations of Logan, not sparing even my women and children. There runs not a drop of my blood in the veins of any living creature. This has called on me for revenge. I have salted. I've killed many. I have fully glutted my vengeance. For my country, I rejoice at the beams of peace. But do not harbor a thought that mine is the joy of fear. Logan never felt fear. He would not turn on his heel to save his life. So who is there left to mourn for Logan? Not one. Not one. As told to Simon Gurdy, and later on put in Thomas Jefferson's history book. Translated to Simon Gurdy, told Lord Dunmore. Simon Gurdy told Chief Johnny Logan's speech to Lord Dunmore. Then it got written down in the history books eventually Thomas Jefferson so that's how we know it's true so the father no, we, uh, the father we of Johnny Logan is Oneida we Chief Shekelemy Shekelemy so the Oneida Chief Shekelemy has a son that was Logan the orator Talgayita I've been calling him Talgayita Johnny Logan some people say he took the name James Logan, which was a friend of Shekelemy. So it's like, who are you? Oh, I'm um, Talgayita. What? Oh, I'm the friend of Shell. Shekelemy. I, st I still don't understand. Oh, Shekelemy is friends with James Logan. Oh, Logan. So, so you know somebody named Logan. Okay, well, then you're Logan now. So Logan's the one that killed a whole bunch of people after his entire family was killed at the Yellow... River, the Yellow Creek Massacre, which is actually ironically near Steubenville, where all those rapes were taking place, and then Kentucky Anonymous came and saved the day. But Virginians, Daniel Greathouse, murdered a whole bunch of Mingo, among them Logan's brother, commonly known as John Petty, and at least two other close female relatives, one of them pregnant and caring for an infant daughter. Her children's father is John Gibson, a prominent trader in the region. These Mingo had been living near the mouth of, the, of Yellow Creek and had been lured to the cabin of Joshua Baker, a settler and rum trader who lived across the Ohio River from the village. The Mingo and Baker's cabin were all murdered except for the infant mixed race child who was spared with the intention of giving her to her father. At least two canoes were dispatched from the Yellow Creek village to aid their members, but they were repelled by Great House's men concealed along the river. All and all approximately a dozen Mingo were murdered in the cabin and on the river. Logan was not present in the area when the massacre took place and was summoned to return by runners. Influential tribal chiefs in the region such as Cornstalk, White Eyes, the Lenape's chief in Guyusuta, Seneca Mingo. Guyusuta, I think, is Simon Gurdy worked or was trained under Gu Guyasuka. So these are all Gu uh, Guyasuda. So Guyasuda was Simon Gurdy, the White Engines, one of my favorite historical figures ever. Guyasuta led Simon Gurdy, and then Simon Gurdy comes out and is has to come back into white society. But he's looking at all this. He's at the Lord Dunmore's war because after. Logan's family is killed on Yellow Creek after the massacre of Yellow Creek. Uh, let's go. He just turns out and just starts killing. Several parties of mixed Mingo and Shawnee warriors struck the frontier, including one led by Logan. They attacked settlers in several frontier regions, both killing and taking captives. 
one known as the Spicer Massacre in Greene County, Pennsylvania. The royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, responded by launching an expedition against the Mingo and the Shawnee in a conflict known as Dunmore's War, 1774. A lot of people say this is one of the main reasons for the American Revolution. And I believe him. I mean, it makes more sense if you look at the larger conflict. Feel your skin so, Logan's family is murdered on Yellow Creek, the Yellow Creek Massacre, Daniel Greathouse, and now he's got nobody that's going to, you know, uh, mourn for him when he dies, so he's got to take revenge, and he was nice, he was one of the, it's like the Naden Hutton, the Naden Hutton Moravians, or the missionaries, or the Christian the praying Indians, Native Americans who adopted Christianity, listened to the white man's rules, got a piece of land legally, and were living there peacefully. And thought that by living there peacefully that the white people would leave them alone, but no, apparently white people were attacking even not just the enemies, but also friends and allies and Christians and Moravian Native Americans, such as in Naden Hutton. And just like a Logan. So Logan, Johnny Logan, James Logan, the orator. I like Taugayita. I don't know. Taugayita is where I... Is what I remember. But I like Taugayita. And, um... Because, I mean, essentially it's just one man who got his entire fucking family murdered, said, fuck this shit, went around and started striking at, out at everybody, and then that inspired Native Americans, and now they had a general Native American war on their hands, and Lord Dunmore, the British royal governor, John Murray, John Murray the fourth, the fourth Earl of Dunmore, I don't know, some fucking British title for Virginia, he was the governor of Virginia, and he actually, when they drove him out, he tried to go into the plantations, attacking all the different plantations and freeing the slaves in each one of the plantations. And then eventually they put him on a, on a boat and, you know, exiled him. But that's Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry did that shit. So, Patrick, I mean, these were military invasions or so whatnot. So, I don't know. Fuck Lord Dunmore, but also fuck, fuck hierarchy of any type, right? So I have, you know, I feel for Logan the Orator. Logan the Orator was just defending his family. He had no family, so he just started attacking anybody and everybody. And he says that his vengeance was quenched, um, but more, a lot of more people had died. And what did Lord Dunmore, he signed the agreement that under the Ohio is his land and over the Ohio, Ohio River is their land. And, of course, none of these boundaries were ever listened to by anybody, really. And um, so I feel for Logan, Logan the Orator. His entire people had died. His Indian Native American culture to if eye for an eye, somebody kills your brother, you're allowed to kill one of their brothers. And that's, uh, that's understood. Because, I mean, that's what they did to you, so that's, you know, a feeling of reciprocity. And then he's famous for Logan's Lament. So he goes on this rampage, killing a lot of settlers after his entire family was killed by Daniel Greathouse and his men. Um, and then there is the Dun Dunmore's War, 1774. And then the Battle of Point Pleasant was the biggest conflict in the Dunmore's War, Dunmore's War. Cornstalk was there, but Logan wasn't there. Simon Gertie was on the side of the Americans, and Simon Gertie goes out and finds Logan. So he goes on a hunt, and he goes on, you know, a sort of a, um, a mission to go find a man, a lone person who started this entire battle, and finds him. He finds him. And Logan tells Simon Gertie this speech. And then the speech is repeated back to Lord Dunmore. Of course, at his, you know, his, at his, he hated it, and then sends more people, more militia groups to go fight and kill some Mingo towns because Logan wouldn't surrender to him. That's what Lord Dunmore wanted, for Logan to surrender to him. And so that's why he was talking about during the course of the long and bloody war, Logan remained idle in his cab cabin and advocate for peace. Anybody that come to his cabin, any white man that came to his cabin, he fed him, he clothed them. He remained idle in his cabin, advocate for peace. He loved the whites so much that even his own Native Americans would point at them and look at that white man lover. What are you, a white lover? What are you, honky lover? Get the hell out of here, you honky lover. I even thought to live with you, but for the injuries of one man, Colonel Creesap. So he blames it on Colonel Creesap. That could be somebody that set all the conditions up. But it was Daniel Greathouse that eventually did it. But that's the colonel. The last spring in cold blood, unprovoked, murdered all the relations of Logan, not even sparing my women and children. There runs not a drop of my blood in the veins of any living creature. This has called on me for revenge. I have salted, I have killed many. I have fully glutted my vengeance. 
For my country, I rejoice at the beams of peace, but do not harbor a thought that mine is the joy of fear. Logan never felt fear. He will not turn on his heel to save his life. Who is there to mourn for Logan? Not one.